George H. Adams, who will be interviewing for Atlanta's Unspoken Past. It is 11.32 a.m. and we are in the Archives Conference Room in McElreath Hall. Mr. Adams will begin the interview uh, just trying to find out some biographical information. If you wouldn't mind begin starting with letting, telling us where you were born, and when you were born, some education, and let's go from there. All right, I was uh, born on February 14th, Valentine's Day in 1936 in Cullowee, North Carolina. Uh, it's a college town now. Uh, and uh, I went to school uh, in a couple of uh, uh, elementary schools before I went to school at the uh, McKee Training Lab, which was the demonstration school for the university, which at the time was a teacher's school. And uh, I was there from the third grade through high school and then on to college at the same place because my parents lived just off the campus. Um, in, high, in elementary school, uh, I was always a good student and uh, I always enjoyed school and enjoyed many, many friends. And uh, I would say a popular student, although I was somewhat of the run of the class being a small boy. Uh, high school, uh, I particularly enjoyed high school and I was very, very active in extracurricular activities and also made good grades and, and enjoyed a lot of friends and uh, especially activities such as a square dancing club we had that uh, uh, entered in competition in Western North Carolina, which was a very popular thing at the time and uh, drama club and things like that. Um, so far as uh, my home life, is that something? Yes. Uh, my home life was that we were, uh, lived in a rural area. My father always had a good job uh, at uh, 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 like a lumber company and later a uh, meat corporation, a paper mill. So uh, financially we certainly were far from being wealthy. But in those days, to have always had a uh, job uh, was uh, somewhat, uh, you know, uh, better off than a lot of other people in rural areas. And uh, we had a very um, austere home, and uh, I never was ashamed to have friends who were sons and daughters of, uh, of uh, the faculty of Western Carolina come to visit home or anything. Uh, I just was very comfortable with all that. I never had my, a chip on my shoulder about, you know, not having this or not having that, that because we did all right. And so far as um, social life, uh, I can't remember when I didn't desire sex with males. Uh, I remember even in the first grade, um, making uh, advances towards uh, male students, fellow male students. And all through the elementary school years, um, I participated in sex with boys, whether it was first cousins or playmates or whatever. Am I going on too much? No, it's fine. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> I would say it was probably about the sixth grade or seventh grade, somewhere along that time. My best friend in the class and I uh, started having sex fairly regular. It seems like fairly regular. It might not have been as regular as I'm thinking now, uh, but I remember it fondly for several years uh, until about the time we were both in the ninth grade, and he, of course, like many boys, uh, decided to go another path sexually. But not to worry, the summer that I had finished the ninth grade, I 
developed a sexual relationship with a, uh, a young, a, a little boy that was about the same age as I. He may have been a year older than me. And uh, we had a sexual affair that lasted uh, throughout high school and to college and has been renewed a couple of times, uh, namely in 1979 and again in 1981. Uh, he's married and a grandfather. Uh, it was not a love relationship. It was simply we were just young men who were friends and enjoyed having sex with each other. And I might add, in a, in a rural setting like that, I fondly remember having sex on Indian mounds, on, in barns, and later on in cars. Uh, we would actually have dates uh, with girls and then arrange to meet after we had taken our, our excuse me, our dates home. Uh, but that was very much closeted even then because I was very active and I was popular in high school and I was my president of the student body and um, I was president of a number of the um, extracurricular club activities. And um, anyway, it was, uh, we kept it uh, very closeted, the relationship. Uh, and it was, it never involved any sentiment or love uh, talk or anything. But um, then after that, let's see, I went to college for one year there in Colorado. And then I was, I was not being a very good student, so another student who was older than I, who, would, who I had known in the basket, on the basketball team, because I had been manager of the basketball team, uh, as well as the other, you know, activities that I did. And he and I talked together one evening, neither were, neither were doing well in school, so we decided to go volunteer for the draft. So in January 19, 56, we both were drafted and taken and sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, during that particular time, which was about 16 weeks, I guess, for the first eight weeks and the second eight weeks, I found my army buddies very, very interesting, but never really had any relationship with any of them. You live in very close quarters, and it's uh, uh, it's <laughs> it, it's very much a turn on. And uh, uh, but I I never would do anything stupid. Uh, I was just friends with a number of them. Uh, I did go into town in Columbia, South Carolina, on a number of occasions because we did get uh, leave almost every weekend. And I observed, I guess, for the first time in my life. Uh, clubs which would have gay people in them, although they weren't labeled gay, they were close to the capital um, there in Columbia, South Carolina. And I went to some of those clubs and I knew that there were gay people there, but How? Uh, How? Me. Uh, actually some of them would talk to me and I was afraid to act out uh, some of the possibilities that I could have. Um, so uh, I would have conversations with them and usually not, uh, you know, go ahead into any relationship because being in the army, I was afraid of the scandal of being discovered and being kicked out. Now I've left out a, a segment of my life. I just realized that uh, was also important in my maturing days in high school. In, after the summer of uh, the ninth grade, the next summer, I guess, ten, after the summer of the ninth, no, starting with the summer of the ninth grade, I went, I went and lived with my sister in eastern North Carolina and in South Carolina. Her husband was in um, construction work and uh, they let me stay with them in order to uh, make money. And I worked very hard, something like 12 hours a day at uh, age 16, um, 
and made my own money and went back to school in the fall and I was never so happy as to uh, be uh, financially independent, especially being independent from my father who I really didn't care a lot for, but he was not physically abusive, abusive but emotionally abusive to me and um, especially to my mother also. But during those summers, I had quite an interesting life working with mature men uh, in a construction company setting where, of course, I became desirous of many of these men, but never, nothing ever, I never let anything like that happen. I was still pretending, you know, to be straight. And uh, their wives would fix me up with um, young women and they would get on my nerves, but I could carry it out. Go have ice cream at the ice cream shop or something. Some of them I dated more than once, but it, I didn't find it that interesting. I found the construction workers much more interesting. And I had three summers of that, which uh, I enjoyed. It was really hard work, but it was very, very good for me. And in those three summers, I did get out a bit. Uh, especially I had a car, I think, after the first summer. And uh, I would go over to Orangeburg and I sometimes would uh, meet uh, men at uh, movies or drugstores or whatever and I had some several relationships that were quite uh, wonderful to me being just a high school boy. But I never sought to, uh, that, that was the problem of being closeted even then was uh, there was a great fear about uh, making um, plans to see anyone like that on the second time because that meant you were really queer. So in my mind I could deal with having sex but I couldn't deal with uh, relation, you know, starting relationships. I particularly remember one event, uh, was a so I was in Columbia, South Carolina in one of those summers and uh, I went to the movie. Uh, it was um, uh, Moulin Rouge, I remember particularly, and there was a soldier sitting behind me and it was the late movie and he made uh, advances toward me and I loved it and we proceeded out of the theater to the capital grounds of the, uh, cap uh, the capital grounds of the state of uh, South Carolina and had a wonderful sexual encounter. And I did see him another time or two, but not much. Because this fear arose that, uh, uh, you know, that some of my, fa my sister's family might see me or something. It was just a very paranoid existence, of course. Uh, that was, that, that was the, those working summers. And getting back, uh, after I did one year in college and went to the Army, and as I had already said, I had I talked to some gay men and so forth, but I never really in that setting did anything because I was very afraid of being caught by the Army and being dishonorably discharged. When all the training was over, then it was to Atlanta on a train with uh, some of my buddies that were a little older than I. They had already finished college. Uh, they were all straight guys and, and I never had any any relationship with them. But the barracks there at Fort McPherson were most interesting because there, I'm sure there were a number of closeted gay guys in my company. But it was all kept uh, very, um, I mean, it was just a friendly basis. And, I had a crush on a number of guys that I became friends with. Sometimes I would go downtown Atlanta by myself and uh, usually to what would be called straight bars, but I could always tell that there was some gay, there weren't many gay bars at the time, so, or at least I didn't know of them. And uh, I would, you know, sometimes uh, be friendly with some guy in one of the bars and at least one occasion I remember uh, you know, going to one's home and having sex. One of the most interesting um, affairs, not affairs, I guess, one of the most interesting uh, uh, 
persons that I met while I was in the Army. It was during the uh, 19, 1956 Democratic Convention. I would go in the day room and watch the convention on color TV. And a couple of nights I found myself and one other guy being the only ones watching the convention. I guess guys at that time in the Army didn't give a rip about politics, but I did. And uh, we made connection physically and uh, left after the convention uh, adjourned that evening. And he was in civilian clothes. Well, we were both in civilian clothes. But we went to his home because he lived off base. He was in G2, which is Army Intelligence, uh, which are supposed to be finding queers and kicking them out of the Army. Uh, but to the contrary, we went to his house, got an Army blanket, and went out in the woods and had wonderful sex. And I saw him uh, several times after that, but we never did get together for sex again. Here again, I was scared, I'm sure he was too. He had more to be scared about than I did, <laughs> probably. <laughs> But anyway, so I didn't have too many, uh, you know, sexual experiences. I had wonderful friendships. When you were, would visit Atlanta, were there any particular bars that you, you went to or frequented? See, now, I was in Atlanta. I was stationed in Atlanta. Fort McPherson okay. is in Atlanta. So I can't tell you that. I can't not tell you any particular bars okay. I went to. Lebs was there, which okay. is a famous song. Um, was a famous delicatessen that got in the news during the civil rights. I know I went there. Uh, I also went to something I think was called the Brown Derby, and it was not one of your upscale kind of bars. But I sensed that it was sprinkled with gay people, but I never had an encounter there. Mm -hmm. uh, then the guys made a lot of jokes uh, in the company I was in there, Fort Mac, about the Wits Inn which I found to be very interesting, just what I'd heard. They did it in a, you know, a derogative way, uh, you know, telling their, asking their buddies if, uh, oh, so you're going to the Wits Inn this weekend. Well, me and two of my straight friends decided, we'd heard so much about it that we wanted to go, so one Friday night, one Saturday night, we did go to the Wits Inn. At, uh, um, it's on 5th Street, it was on 5th Street at Spring. And indeed, it was a gay bar in a sense. We were seated in the cabaret, which was tables where you had drinks and possibly the food, I'm not, I don't know. But it was the first drag show I had ever seen in public. It was not billed as a drag show, but, but the owner and his wife uh, did these little numbers where he would put on a wig uh, uh, and pretend to be the woman, uh, like in doing uh, uh, some lip syncing. I particularly remember he liked to do one of the country singer Jeannie Shepherd. But also, since we were there, I decided it seemed to be all straight guys and, and their dates and their wives or whatever in this cabaret. But it didn't take me long to determine that just over to my left was a bar, a very narrow bar that had nothing but men in it. Oh, oh this is wonderful. This is a gay bar. So that's what they'd been joking all along about. But it had straight people in the cabaret and gay people in the bar. Well, needless to say, that intrigued me, really intrigued me, but still I was, very much afraid to go to a place like that, being in the army. So, through my through my army life there, which ended in 1958, and I went back to uh, North Carolina and my home uh, to begin college, and finished my three years of college there. During that time, I still had a relationship with my high school friend. And uh, in my maybe later years there in college, I got the courage to drive over to Asheville and just look around. And sure enough, I found some gay life going on there. It was very, very covert at the time. But I had a few relationships, but one-time relationships, one-time 
getting together for sex, uh, mainly. And um, in college, I had my local friends, and uh, then I had my college friends, because I was a day student. So, so I had the best of both, both worlds. And among some of my, you know, friends in the community, you know, I almost gave myself away a time or two because one of my best friends from high school, his mother had a camp out in the mountains, and us guys would, after square dances or whatever, we would go out there and spend the night, maybe two nights, and uh, I was drinking by then. I never drank in high school. Um, sometimes I would not know what I was doing and make passes, make moves on guys, but for reasons that I've never quite understood, they never really labeled me a queer or got on to me. They laughed about it, mostly. Uh, because I really didn't have sex with any of that group, except the one that I'd been having sex with all through high school and college. But um, that, uh, and when I finished college, well, I, I had, um, I remember particularly be, becoming friends with a guy older than I was, who was a student, he had been in army already, and uh, there was no reason not to believe that he wasn't gay, but he was married and had a stepson. He was very friendly with my English teacher, and she was very friendly with me. She probably always knew that I was gay, but, you know, it was never talked about. But I became friends with him, this guy, and he would have me over and cook spaghetti dinners and stuff, and we would have some wine and just have a wonderful, friendly relationship. But there was never any sex involved. But one Saturday, he asked me if I wanted to go up to one of the um, one of the homes of one of the English professors. Most of the English professors were gay from the, there at the university, which I don't think is unusual. Anyway, I went with him, and sure enough, there were at least three male English professors, and they had some guys visiting from uh, Atlanta. And I thought, oh my God, this would be wonderful if I was an out gay person. But I wasn't, and I still didn't really, I mean, I just enjoyed it, but I didn't do anything or allow myself to get too enthusiastic about it. But um, Gene, the friend that I went there with, he never mentioned it, anything about being gay or anything. I guess, I don't know, I just don't know. It was there and it was, that's what it was. But we didn't talk about it. And again, I repeat, we, we never had any, any, anything close to a sexual encounter. And uh, of course, I graduated in 1960 from Western. I did have one little uh, uh, encounter, but I think the guy was as afraid, of, as, afraid as I was for it to go into a second one. But. I was very much wanting to, but he he never uh, followed up on my attempts to make contact. Uh, he was a business major like I was, and probably very scared. But it was a it was a wonderful encounter, uh, the one I had. <laughs> <laughs> After that, it was um, back to Atlanta. Uh, Why did you choose to go back to Atlanta? Oh, I had become enamored of Atlanta as a big city, uh, a big city at that time was not a very big city. And I knew, I knew that there was a gay life there, that I could, you know, operate at least on the periphery. Uh, it, it made me feel good to know that that was there. Uh, and uh, I never, I never had the intention of throwing myself into it, you know, full force. But that's the reason I went back. And uh, when I came, I first came to interview for a job uh, that a man at this. I had worked at these summer resorts in the mountains, which I've left out totally. But um, I'll pursue that if you want me to. But anyway, um, I came to stay temporarily in Atlanta, uh, I guess right after I got out of college. Uh, 
and I was job hunting. And the first weekend after my job hunting, I was staying in a boarding house. People in this day and time don't really know what boarding houses were, but young people stayed in boarding houses in those days when they came to town and didn't have means to stay in hotels, which almost none of us did. But uh, the very first weekend, I headed to Wits End. And I thought, oh my God, this is heaven. This really is heaven. And I met some guy who said, oh, well, everybody that germs from here and goes over to Miss Peace. Well, that was really heaven. <laughs> and, uh, uh, oh, and then we went from there to uh, Pappy's Plantation Lounge, which was a part of Mammy's Shanty. But it was a separate little bar that a lot of gay people went to. And sure, the straight people there knew nothing about it, because it was not a gay bar. It's just that we went there after sort of closing time for bars. Uh, and then further on to another place called either John's or Papa John's. It was a restaurant that people went to late at night, and a lot of them were gay people. It was near Collier, it was on Peachtree near Collier Road. Anyway, uh, I didn't get a job because I still had some Army Reserve duty to do. So I decided to go back to North Carolina, do my Reserve duty, and then come back, uh, which is exactly what I did. And then when I came back, I was back permanently. Again, staying at the boarding house on Briarcliff Road. You remember the name? Uh, it, it was 814 Briarcliff and it was operated by a Mrs. Jones. And there were guys and girls, mostly guys. Here again, I, um, you know, I made friendships there at the boarding house. And me and one of the guys who I had a lot of desire for uh, moved out into an apartment because I had gotten a job. I got a job with a life insurance company in Georgia. Uh, of course, again, here again, I started going to Wits End and uh, Miss Peace occasionally, and I discovered uh, Piccolo Lounge, which was wonderful. Uh, you may have already heard of it in your interviews, I'm sure. It was a, a lounge that adjoined a popular uh, Italian restaurant at uh, 14th Street, where the Peachtree Art Theater used to be. There's a high-rise, not a high-rise condo, there's a high-rise uh, office building there now. It's, in fact, Margaret Mitchell was killed crossing the street going to the Peachtree Art Theater. So it attracted uh, some bohemian types in that area. <clears throat> and I really did like going there. But my, uh, my habit was, once I got here and settled and everything, I did not go out to gay bars every night. I didn't go out to gay bars even every weekend. I would go out and then I would feel, I'd have these feelings of uh, remorse about being queer. So I would get over it by the time I went to work on Monday. And then I would be back in my happy little straight life, having friendships with straight people, dating, Going so, to parties with straight people. So you were seeing women during the time? Uh, yes, I was seeing women uh, 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 all the time because people would fix me up with people. And some of them I actually felt rather close to. In fact, I considered marrying one of them. She was a sister to a girl that I supervised at Life Insurance Company of Georgia. And we had a relationship. I can't tell you how long it went, but. I, I was very much attracted to her. We never had sex, but I was attracted to her sexually. Uh, I used the excuse to break up with her that she, I think, wanted to make me jealous because I was not, uh, I was not aggressive sexually, so she went out with somebody else. Well, it didn't make me jealous, it just, well, it did make me jealous, but that was the end of my relationship with her. I called her up on the phone and told her so, and she said, we well, have clothes over here, I said, just put them in the garbage. And so, that was it. Uh, and uh, 
and I became friends with a lot of the young women at Lop, Georgia, and we would go to um, to dance clubs together, which I really enjoyed. Uh, a lot of times I would disappear without telling them, and I would go to Ms. P's or the Cove later on, or somewhere else. And they never did make a big thing out of asking me why I disappeared. Uh, I would just say, well, I felt like leaving. And I would go to those places I knew and a lot of times have encounters. And here again, I remember distinctly um, having a lot of remorse about it. And I would get over it by the, week, by the time the weekend was over. And then I would be back in that world of young business people, socially and work-wise. But I would always go back to the gay bar. Uh, I did date other girls other than the one that I, that I told you that I uh, decided to break up with. I dated other ones. I never got, well, I did get very, very serious with one later on, and I would go home with her, uh, go to her home, and and weekends sometimes. Her father liked me very much. But these fathers always liked me very much and wanted to start talking about getting me into their business or something. Uh, we would stay out in the car, even at her home, petting. Uh, but um, I knew that I shouldn't. I I knew that I should not get married. I absolutely knew that I was not going to take that risk of, you know, ruining somebody else's life and possibly mine too. So I don't know why I broke up with her, but I did. There was another one I was serious, I keep thinking now, <laughs> ones that I was serious about. But I always found reasons to end it. One announced to her family that she was going to marry me. Friends of hers told me that, so I backed off then. She got a job with the civil service and went to Rome, which was a real break for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, those, uh, and then, I'm talking about 60s. Those were like 1960 up, through, up to 1968. 1968, I went to my second job. I never had but two jobs in my entire motion picture career. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I went to Georgia Tech in 1968, and uh, yeah, I was still pretending, you know. Then in 1972, well, I remember distinctly meeting some guys in bars, one in particular, who invited me to a party in his apartment in Buckhead, but I didn't go. I just couldn't see myself going to a gay party. Uh, I know I would have had a lot of fun, but I just denied myself on this because of this closeting, this extreme closeting, you know, and I'm being afraid to be labeled a queer. But in 1972, I had already met this professor at Georgia Tech, and uh, I was supposed to go to North Carolina to see my parents on a weekend, and somehow I saw him on the campus or something, and it was raining, it was very stormy, and he said, why don't you come go with me to the El Matador? And I did, so I discovered another bar, but that was strictly in 1971 or two, and then that's when I came out, uh, and I started going regularly to the El Matador, where I proceeded to make friends easily with a lot of people, and I no longer feared being gay, and I no longer feared having uh, friendly and sexual, social relationships with guys. And I met a guy who I have been friends with now, right up through today. In fact, we're going on a cruise together in December. And I value that relationship so. And there were a few others. Uh, my longest relationship, which was three years with a married man, I also met him there. 
In fact, I met probably all the people, most of the people until some more recent years, were people I met at, uh, at the El Matador. I was never really one to um, have permanent relationships. Uh, they used to call me Backstreet because I would uh, <laughs> have relationships with married men. But I don't know. I guess I have my own explanation for it. Uh, I've read a lot about people who do this. I think it was my way of not being totally queer. And it was my way of not being attached because I didn't want to be attached at the hip to someone. I told people I did not want to be a pair of doves where you were, you know, mates for life. I think it was my way of maintaining, it's two things, I think it was maintaining my independence, which I've been very, very fierce about. And uh, also, maybe I wasn't totally queer if uh, I went with a married man. Maybe they were safer. And then at times, uh, even when I went with a married man, he, they always have to get up and go home. And he would get up and go home and I would go out. Uh, so I think I had the best of all worlds, and uh, in the end, I, was ne I wasn't sorry of it. There was something about him I didn't trust anyway, and I was very proud of myself for having had other relationships or other encounters, sexual encounters, because uh, he, he betrayed me in the end, and of course I dumped him as soon as I found out for sure. I had suspected you know, that he had done that. But um, that takes me up to about 19, God, 77. And um, I've, being at Georgia Tech, of course I retired from there in 1993, and um, my early years there I was afraid to park my car, like in the, you know, late 60s. Early 70s. I was afraid to park my car at a, uh, at a gay bar. I was afraid that I'd be caught being a queer. And um, now, and in, oh, in my later years there, as I left in '93, they had already had a human resources director who was an out gay man. They had already had a special assistant to the president who was an out gay man. And they had already had a vice president who was an out gay man. So all of that paranoia from 68 on uh, changed so drastically in those years up to 93 when I left. And there was, there was a student gay group. There were rainbow flags all over people's cars. And it was all right to be gay, which I found rather satisfying. Um, after all those years. I spent 25 full years then. And I had 27 years toward retirement because I got some time for my military time. But that's, that was my career, business-wise, gay-wise. <laughs> <laughs> Your career. <laughs> Speaking to, um, you were here during the 60s and 70s, could you remark any on how religion shaped your sense of self or race or gender? Uh, religion really never played a big part in my life uh, after high school. I think uh, the girl I dated in high school, I went to church with her. A few, I, I went to a rural church up through about my junior year and then I went with her a few times. But when I came to Atlanta, the only time I went to church, I think, was Grace Methodist Church. Uh, so it was entirely social. So religion didn't really have any part in my adult life. Not an important part. Mm -hmm. Race, race-wise, I can tell you a few stories. Um, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, in my very early '60s, in the in the in the very early '60s. There were uh, demonstrations uh, in labs, and 
other places, and then I don't know how. It must have been about 1963. I discovered um, uh, the Carousel Lounge at uh, what was the restaurant they just closed? It was a black restaurant. Um, can't think. It was the, it was two brothers ran it. And they, it just closed recently, and there was a hue and cry about it closing because it was important to the civil rights movement. Well, I discovered their carousel lounge, which had wonderful jazz and big name jazz, and it was still just about just before. And I went there, and I liked the entertainment, and I met. Uh, a few black men that I had uh, encounters with. The first one was a very strange, it was very strange for me because I left the carousel with him and went to his apartment in southwest Atlanta and waking up, uh, it was, it was an, a wonderful encounter, and waking up and seeing family pictures on the wall that were all black people was rather startling. I never felt that I was ever a bigot, but it's just an unusual you know, situation. It's what shocked me, not that I was with a black person. Uh, another time I met a young man there, and uh, integration was sort of taking hold at that time. A young black man, and he worked at one of the lounges that um, had um, strippers on Peachtree, about Peachtree and Fifth, I think. It may have been called the Zebra Lounge or something like that. But he wanted me to go with him and go there, and I was really afraid to because I knew that that was not acceptable yet in that plant for a black and white person to be together. And I was just a little bit too chick, and I regret that I was that way. But you have to think about a lot of things, you know, and I went there with him. I mean, I went to the door, but I wouldn't go in. And I just disappeared, and that was, I regret being that way. But I feel like that the times, you know, kind of commanded what I felt I could do and not do. Uh, then it wasn't long until full integration. And, um, a lot, of, most of the, most of the gay places I went to didn't have many um, uh, African Americans, but uh, there were some places I went that did have. Uh, there, there were always some that came to the armory, and there was a club on Peachtree, and I can't think of the name. No, West Peachtree, near the line of Biltmore. It had formerly been the Black Sheep Club, which is a, a white man's social club. It became a gay club later, and I went there. Uh, I, you mentioned religion, you mentioned uh, race. Did you mention anything else? Uh, Gender, uh, in terms of... Um, what you saw. Did you, did you ever meet any women that you knew were lesbians? Or any? E Am I supposed to be frank on here? Or will I, I get, hope so. <laughs> will I get lynched? <laughs> I never, I had one lesbian friend. She was a lipstick lesbian that I worked with at Georgia Tech. I liked her a great deal and we're still friends. I never enjoyed the friendship of lesbians. Uh, not that I found them enemies. I think one of the things that I didn't like about them, and I don't like about them today. They love to, uh, they love to describe gay men as sissies, and I detest that. I detest it from anybody, and I particularly uh, detest it from lesbians. Uh, I get the idea, I think I'm I may be too critical, but it's the way I think. I think they'd like to think themselves butcher than any gay male. And I, don't, I just don't like it. I don't enjoy their company. 
and I, and I never had, I had a few acquaintances. My friend Al, that I met in 72, he had a couple of lesbian friends, and we did go visit them a few times in Macon, but I never considered them that close. It's not that I hate lesbians, it's just that I have a thing about, um, you know, some of their um, characteristics. So your social circle was mostly men. Oh yes, 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 and straight, straight women. I've always had a lot of straight female friends, and um, especially at Georgia Tech and people that I see even today, and uh, most of them, not all, but most of them know I'm gay, which they have not had a problem with. I've always found straight women more accepting than straight males. Although I've had, uh, among straight males, it's been my observation that those that I have become good friends with were guys who had no question about their own sexuality. And if they ever even suspicion I was gay, it would not have mattered to them. Uh, Let me pause okay. and um, turn the cassette over. Okay. Uh, and it, it makes me, <clears throat> excuse me, it makes me feel bad that he would forward those kind of things. So that also makes me wonder what he th thinks about me, who I am. Uh, he may think I'm still a Republican. I'm not a Republican, neither am I a Democrat. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, I vote mostly, well, I voted for presidential, Democratic presidential candidates ever since um, Clinton's second term, at least. But um, I still have this thing about uh, coming out to him. And I haven't talked about my health, and I don't, don't know if I should. Well, before we do that, um, I was just wanting to sure. ask you a couple of things. Because uh, you were meeting men during the 60s. Yes. And during the 50s. And yes. When you would recognize them, were there, how did you know? Were, was there any you know codes, language, um, anything that kind of clued you in that you, you know, anything that you knew? How were you able to read that person? I can't say as I was. I just, I knew, and I wasn't, I wasn't real forward about, you know, making passes at them. I don't know. I, I really can't describe it. Somehow I would know. Uh, in one particular, Incident. This was a married man too, and about 1963, I was in uh, graduate school, and one night I was at Miss P's, and this man came on to me physically, and he said to me right away because I didn't respond immediately, and he said to me right away. Uh, well, you know, I am interested in you physically. Uh, I'd like to have sex with you. If you don't want to, then that's okay. Of course, I did want to, so I had to change my way of reacting to him. And he too was a married man, who I still think about a lot. Uh, so we had a short affair. And, um, he told me that his wife was suspecting him of something, meaning being with another woman. So he broke it off. And then we ran into each other in a straight bar on Roswell Road and started all over again. And the last date I ever made with him, he, just, he called up and decided, and said that he was not acting out his sexuality anymore. So that was the last time I ever talked to him. But I hate to go on about that, but it was that was okay. an unusual right. encounter. That was direct. I mean, he okay. just said directly. And if you want to talk about your health, that's. 
I'm not sure if I should. I don't know. I don't know where the tape ends up. Um. We can well, if you want to, let's pause at this point. And we can talk All about right. that. We're going to continue the interview with George Adams, and we'll offer these remarks as concluding remarks. All right. Just something else you want to add to the interview. Yes, I, I did want to discuss briefly uh, my health. Uh, I was diagnosed with AIDS in 1992, and uh, I've gone to support groups constantly since that time, which have been very helpful. And fortunately, I've been in very good health for a man of my age. Uh, one of the one of the worst effects was the effect it had on my sex life, which. Uh, it almost ended for all practical purposes. Um, I had met a man at, I, I lived downtown and went to the hotel bars and had many encounters, I might say. Uh, the night before I got the diagnosis, I had been with um, a professor at another college in Georgia and uh, beginning with that, we had safe sex. I had been having what I thought was safe sex since at least 1984. And I had full-blown AIDS, however, when I was uh, diagnosed in 1992. The way it has affected my life, one of the many ways it has affected my life is, as I just said, uh, it meant the end of my sex life as I knew it because one has to reveal their status. That is, if he's a moral person, I wouldn't think about having any kind of sex with anyone without revealing my status. Therefore, I'm reluctant, even, and at 68, I still have chances, believe it or not. <laughs> um, however, having, knowing that I have to reveal my status, then there's this horrible fear of rejection, which has happened a few times, uh, which makes me less uh, open to revealing it. Uh, so uh, my sex life has been confined to others who uh, are positive. Uh, even then, of course, as everyone knows, you still have to practice safe sex, but at least you don't have that um, that fear of rejection, but it uh, really affects uh, one's sex life very, very negatively, at least mine. And I fear so much that some younger people especially may not be, you know, revealing uh, their status, which bothers me a lot, and I've kind of lectured a few of my young friends. I do have friendships with a lot of people that are half my age. I find them much more interesting than people my age. <laughs> uh, that's not to write off people my age, but um, and and it's really it, it's really affects you. Um, it affects you very very negatively. It's like it's something has been taken away that was very important. It was very important to me because I was always a very sexual person. So, um, uh, there's not much I can do about it except what I do. That's if I, I would reveal it if I got close to being uh, intimate with anyone. And that's about all I would say about that. Okay. Well, anything else you would like to add? Not really. I think I may have covered some of my life, but there's, there really is so much. And uh, I'm always surprised at my younger friends especially who tell me they came out when two years after they were out of college or they came out when they were 40-some years old. I don't understand that because as I said in the beginning, I have no memory of not wanting 
to have sex with males. And I guess, I, I, don't, I don't understand, uh, well, I do understand coming out, the social thing, but I don't quite understand not having acted out my sexuality from the beginning. And maybe some people were just, you know, so afraid, as I was. I was afraid, but I did it too. So I don't quite understand that, and I'm sorry that people have had to be, you know, so positive for so many years. And um, I like very much that the younger generation has this wonderful freedom. Uh, I don't regret it. I really don't regret much of anything. It's just that I have enjoyed my life, sexually and otherwise. So I have no regrets. That's a beautiful way to end. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming in today and allowing us to interview you. I will now stop the tapes.